Hello, this is Neo, just an average CSGO player, and you're watching Florin's YouTube channel. Right, this is going to be another episode of Reflections, and my guest for this one is going to be Sickness, who is an old-school veteran Counter-Strike player. Right, one of the problems with being in esports for as long as I have been is basically anyone past about five years becomes a veteran, right? So when I even say that opening line, Sickness, people might not realise you basically are almost as veteran as it is possible to be in Counter-Strike. I'm guessing you basically played like the immediate beaters, right? Did you play from the very beginning? Yeah, so like uh, RS, which is like the team that I played on, we started as a team in Quake One, Quake Two. We were playing oh, Doom wow. when we were kids on dial-up. Like a lot of a lot of the people, like Rambo and and and, and Morphs on those old schoolers. We played when we were playing Doom. Oh, Quake are you actually One, playing two. on the? Um, I mean, I know people like Immortal used to play and on the yeah, dial-up Duango, whatever it was called, where you played Doom yeah, on a, a so modem, we had right? Players that played on Duango, yeah, right. Duango. We went to the early Quake Cons and CPLs, right. so we were okay. competing. We actually competed in tournaments with Immortal and Unholy, Machiavelli, just all fatality right. like those players. So we were kind of early Quake players and Team Fortress players. So um, we kind of been playing competitive games since we were little kids. And then we kind of pivoted into Counter-Strike when version 3 came out. We kind of downloaded it on a whim because when you play Quake and Quake 2, you would download mods. You'd of get course. bored of Quake, you'd download yeah. mods, and you'd have fun because we would just, you know, we'd get off our bus route, go to a friend's house, and we would land. And Counter-Strike was just one of those games we downloaded, like I think it was version three. And it's funny because we played it and we just uninstalled it because we hated it. Sure. And then we went and then and then we gave it another chance, like sure. in version four. So um <laughs> it is a completely obviously it's a completely different game than than Go is now or CS2, but it it was in the beginning, like players would drop backpacks, you'd pick up ammo. Um in the early stages of competing in Counter-Strike, there was gun running. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, where like you would kill a player in the middle of the round. Oh, yeah. And instead of ending the round, you'd leave one of their players alive. You'd run all the guns they dropped to your spawn so that when you spawn the next round, you'd pick them up. So there were various different things like that. So yeah, I mean, whereas, you know, I, I'd say like we're like the Will Chamberlains of Counter-Strike. Sure. Like nobody actually saw him play. They only heard about all the things that sure. he did. Until later on, when he was a bit washed and, and on the Lakers at a later time where people saw him and he wasn't just as crazy as he used to be, right? So we were just, we were early. And yeah, most people haven't heard about most of us other than maybe sure. like Rambo, right? Well, the funny thing is, if anyone watched my actual interviews with people who were in the, your era of Rambo and Chameleon and people like that, even then they won't realize I actually purposely keep some history back because even those people weren't involved. Because one of the things that people might know is that they were involved with the first like official CPLs for Counter-Strike. Yeah. But I know that they used to have them, all the quick ones, right? If you went to like the Razor's EPL, or the, they used to have in the BYOC like unofficial tons. It's basically before CPL adopted it, right? Were yeah. you playing at these? I mean, you were going to these Texas lands, right? Yeah, so like the first official official CPL I remember that was like big was Babbage's, right? That yes. was the one I think that Eyeballers won yeah. and we were with Syndicate. That was the big officially sanctioned, had a huge tournament area. Before that, there were a few CPLs that um, Frank Nuccio ran before he kind of petitioned with the CPL because Quake was the big game. We would have a BYOC area where we would run Counter-Strike tournaments and RS was winning those Counter-Strike tournaments. Usually we would be playing like DOP, Domain of Pain, um, we would be playing CK3, Tau, those those kind of players and stuff. We'd be playing them, and we would win those tournaments. We actually won a QuakeCon. We won a couple CPLs before they went to Babbage's, right? So we were playing and winning those tournaments, and that's where we kind of ran into kind of the local scene, right? So um, we felt, in the beginning, we were a bit ahead of everybody just strictly because we had so much experience playing um, Capture the Flag right. and Quake. Which is like, you know, it's team play. You, there's map control, item control, flag control, group together, go to different areas. An early Counter Strike from like three to five point two was pretty much um, strafe jumping, like quick strafe jumping yeah. in Counter Strike, right? And it was just really fast paced. You could jump around with the op, um, stationary crosshair. That's the big thing. They didn't move to that dynamic crosshair until like version. I, I think it was like one point five, one point six when they changed the net code too. The net code in early Counter Strike was very similar to Quake. You'd have to time shots, right, if you had hundred ping yes. or higher. So, yeah, I mean it's. It's crazy, but yeah, we were winning those earlier tournaments and then kind of things got a bit more organized where we had an official area like with uh, Babbage's CPL, which was like the first one that, that I remember. And then after that, I think it was Speakeasy and then Razor and so on. So Counter-Strike just started to grow and grow. I mean, we didn't even have HLTV until um, Speakeasy CPL. I think that was the first CPL that we we got the HLTV yes. on like a 30-second delay. So yes. that was uh, pretty cool. 
Another thing people might notice is I ventured the question to Chameleon. Did he remember having like Immortal, for example, in his team? You could tell he couldn't remember. And it, obviously he wasn't yeah. a Quake person. So Tim, it was no big deal. Now, you know who that is. Like Immortal was one of the absolute best like Quake dual players probably yeah. ever. It's like a mad talent. So was, I remember seeing a few demos of him back in the day. Was he any good in CS? Was he, so, why was he in your crew? Yeah. I mean, just like with, um, you know, John, uh, Jonathan, like um, Fatality and Immortal, like the Quake players and, and there's other players like Carnage and stuff. They all kind of got into Counter-Strike, but their problem was they could never beat the solo mentality. It was kind of hero ball. It was like, right. I got to flick and hit this crazy shot. I'm going to do everything on my own. It's just the team element. And then a lot of the a lot of the weapons in Quake and, and whatever, they're all hit scan, right? Yes. So it's it's just uh, it's just different. And they couldn't get it ahead of that mentality. Their aim was sick. They would hit six shots and stuff, but they're usually just relying on themselves, right? Unless you get like a, maybe a team DM kind of quake player, then they, they'd have to learn it. But it's just they could never get used to the physics of the game, but they always had the aim. I mean, you, you have aim no matter what game you play. It's just the mindset of the slower mentality. Because in the early times, if they came over in like 5-2, they probably would have been amazing because it right. was fast paced. I mean, with the op back in the day, you had a stationary crosshair, you didn't have to counter strafe as much. You could just put it on a corner and a person just comes in front of it and you kill him or you don't even have to zoom, right? Yeah, if people don't know so, also, the no scope was 100% accurate, whereas in CSGO it has like a yeah. randomized element. It was completely accurate. I mean, you used to do it all the time. 100% accurate. You could just wait on a corner and a yeah. guy would just come through and you just kill him. The field of view was wider. I think, I can't remember where they narrowed it down to where you only see through right. the scope versus where you could see the whole screen. Like when yeah. they changed that, it was like insane. I remember when you were doing your interview with um, Chameleon, he was just like, oh, they slowed it down. And that's when I just didn't like it. I mean, he would complain all the time about it because he came from Half-Life DM and it was just like super fast paced, jumping yeah. around. And Counter-Strike was quick at that point. And then over time, they kind of slowed it down. They added the net code and, and things kind of changed. Yeah. By the way, uh, give me some thoughts on Chameleon, a.k.a. Porter, because obviously he is, even though people know from X3, he came from your group originally, and then he went to X3 when they made the yeah. team, right? Who was this guy? Yeah, we met him because um, he was a roommate with Frank Nuccio, kind of the, the, everybody knows him as the commissioner of the CPL. He lived there, and we would go over and we would land there kind of in the early times because Frank had, he had this website called Domain of Games at the time, which turned into the Cal website essentially at some point. But it had forums, it had servers, and we would all join the server and we play each other, talk smack to each other, and then we realized we all live in the same area. And then at some point, um, we would kind of meet up and we would play. And, and Dustin's just unique. I mean, he like your interview with him is who he is. He has not changed over the twenty years of time that have passed. I mean, that's who he is. He tells you to your face. He was never. You never have to like in Counter Strike now. You got to worry about like players kind of scheming to kick you when you start sucking. Dustin was never like that. If you sucked, he would just tell you you sucked. Like. I'm just like, I'm, we're going to have to replace you. You're just not good enough. We're going to have to go for somebody else. Like he would never scheme behind your back. He would tell you straight to your face. And so he was a character. I mean, he was a great guy. He was really smart. He was super, super ahead of its time. I mean, in modern Counter-Strike, you've got like these tactician type IGLs and you've got lining up smokes with your gloves and, and your knife and skyboxes and things like that. He was doing stuff like that early on in Counter-Strike, which is why like a lot of people gravitated towards him. I mean, I remember going to his place and he had uh, multiple hard drives full of screenshots of like oh, his strategies. Okay. Like, I'm not even kidding. Like when we joined yeah, Syndicate, yeah. he's all right, let me pull out my <laughs> scrapbook. He had a printed scrapbook, binded and everything. Like he went to Kinko's and did it. And then he's like, all right, here's a screenshot. And you would just see frame by frame of, I remember Cobble where you, you, know, you throw the smoke, landed between the doors, then you would cross and then somebody would throw flash here. I mean, he was really, really early. By the way, for people um, who don't appreciate it, that probably didn't exist in even pro teams no. for a year or two. Like, pretty, so I know, for example, those like NIP guys used to essentially play like default CS, mate. They sort of just, you know, yeah. they had a rough idea what they were going to do, but no one was doing This is like NFL playbook level shit. Yeah. The playbook stuff didn't come out until like Dustin was doing it. I remember a lot of the early teams. I mean, even in, in RS, it was... We had kind of a dynamic buddy system is what we called it, where it's like, okay, we know Rambo can take space. And we don't want to crowd him and have him, you know, friendly fire. We need him to just go and get a kill. I mean, that's usually what we'd say. Like, Rambo, you go to this side, you get a kill, and then we're going to move over here. And then we would have two players buddy up and another two players buddy up. So everybody would just kind of work together and work off of each other and trade. And that's just basically how we played. It was just free flow, kind of see what the other team is doing and just do it. And it wasn't until maybe, it wasn't until Dustin. And then after that, you had kind of the TSOs where it was just like they had set strats, they had executes, they had smokes and everything, and that's where you have to get a bit more tactical with, with your gameplay. It was just um, 1.6 was very skill-based. Like if you had enough skilled players, you could win. 
But then maybe that extra 5% came from that person like Moto or Chameleon, you know, those people that just knew what to do, right? Um, and had the strats and you could fall back on it. When the dynamic stuff didn't work, when, you know, moving around didn't work, you could just rely on the default and just win around. As you referenced, you also knew Rambo before he was Rambo, before he was X3 Rambo, before he was yeah. Team 3. So who was this guy? Because this is another person where I've always thought, he's actually one of the people I, I always say, it's like you would never guess he was like a star player at any sort of a sport. He's yeah. got such a self-effacing sort of personality, right? Super reserved, very quiet, very, very smart, very calm. I mean, the way he acted in real life is basically how he played games. And right. he never had the best computer. I remember he would always play, like, I would upgrade my computer and I would give him my parts from, like, three years ago. Right. And we'd give him a computer. And and back in the day, you could hit the plus and minus sign on the keyboard and make the, the screen smaller so that you can get more FPS. So he was playing Counter-Strike on, like, a tiny, like, 320 by 200 display sometimes because okay. he'd play on his old Celeron <laughs> computer. Um, there was one time where his monitor, like, it was just messed up. It was all different colors. It looked like Predator mode, and we would laugh right. at him saying, oh, Brambo's in Predator mode. He's just going to track us down and kill us. And in the group of friends we had, I mean, he was the best at Quake. He's the best at Quake 2. He was just the best at Counter-Strike. And we met in kind of, like, middle school, actually. We were on the same bus route. And we would just, you know, we would ride the bus, we'd play games and, and just talk about just different stuff. And we played, you know, we played Quake, Team Fortress, Ultima Online was the thing. He would always come to my house because I had a second computer and we would just play. So much of like what I learned from competitive play, you know, came from him and the friends we played with at our lands and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, he's a very unique, amazing, amazing player. I mean, out of all the players that I've played with, he's probably, I mean, him and K-Sharp are the best, obviously. Um it's it's hard to like tell people like how good they were like oh, sure. if i have to kind of compare it to like modern day counter strike like k shark was kind of like zaiwu where he's amazing he could do everything like when he wanted to but he was a nice guy he wasn't like i'm just gonna crush you and destroy you he was just a really nice kid rambo was more like the nico like strict like stick to business this is the strap this is what we need to do In incredible aim incredible nerves i mean he was just really good um, complete opposite mindset of Kyle. Kyle was just very friendly. So, I mean, this is really back then it was, that's who they were. They were just top players. People were afraid of him. Actually, Rambo's alias was Rambo Asian <laughs> in the beginning. That's okay. where he was. And the reason um, we called him Rambo is we used to play mansion in old school Counter-Strike. And he would just, it, it would be like five of us in the mansion protecting the hostages. And he would just buy the para. He'd come through with the para, Rambo style, through the front door, wouldn't bother going around the back, okay. the side. And he would just mow everybody down, like recoil control and just destroy everybody. And then he would use the commando too. And it was just like, that's why we just we called him Rambo. We just run people over. Just He wouldn't go through the back, wouldn't sneak in. He would just come in out aim you. One of the things you're referencing is something that's really hard, unfortunately, to explain to anyone who didn't play a version before 1.5, which is the thing Chameleon said about dumbing the game down. I always told people, I was against it because I was also from Quake and I came from the days of the beaters when it was more arcadey. In fact, if people don't know, even the first Call of Duty was a way more arcadey game. It wasn't like this slow style tack FPS that we've called the genre now. But the thing is, I can see why Valve liked it because it does make the game more about team play. Like it sort of leveled the individual skill because as you're saying, people can't really appreciate it now like you'd have to use the extremes like simple or z like the totally insane players who every game yeah. that all these elite players you're talking about like the chameleons of the world the mortals the canes the k shot these players when they played before 1.5 it was like will chamberlain or something right they would just they would just dominate a game if they were playing like yeah. the fourth best team they're going to destroy them right like these guys individually were enormous in the game right yeah i mean it a lot of the things that you see, smoke grenades, right? Smoke, smoke grenades and Molotovs, that didn't exist, yes. right? You needed to, and, and you would we, we would be playing maps like Dust One, Assaults. We had matches on Siege. We had matches on Docks. We had matches on Office where you would have to get the hostages. We had matches on Italy, right? Like we had these crazy matches. There were there was no there was no map pool. It was like yes. play whatever map you're good at, which is why these events and everything was so difficult. One, yeah. the rules were changing. Two. There was no set map pool. It was all double elimination. The rule set was insane. So like you could just, you know, we would get screwed in some events because we just weren't good on train. And then we'd have to play train in the quarterfinals yeah. and then we get knocked down to the, the you know, the bottom. And we'd have to Dude, make people don't to even track. know. They think that's only, you know, like the odd map. Like they know the one about, they know the stories about fire and mill, right? The Europeans didn't play. It's, yeah. it's worse than that. Like you're saying, bro, there's people in CPLs I know came from Europe who were top teams. And then they found out like, we're playing Prodigy. Like that's not even a map. Like yeah. that's like real. You'd have to just play these maps, right? If you didn't know how to play that better than that map, just show a lock, right? You just lose, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a hilarious story about that. So. Go on. 
um, Esports United, when we played, I think it was like 2003 CPL, they flew over from Sweden and it was a lineup of Veslon, Quick, Swift, and uh, Dark, I think. And Notorious, yeah, that's right. Okay. And um, I remember because we would we would boot camp. We boot camped with them at our land center with Rival. And we were, I, I've never been destroyed so hard in my life. We were torqued by them. We were torqued by Rival. We lost every single game. And um, Veslon, whenever I would talk to him, because at the time it was the IG, I'm like, hey, we got to practice mill. We got to practice mill. And I'm no shit you. I quote you. Told you this directly. He said, "We don't need to play mill. We're not going to be in the losers bracket. Oh, we just don't need to play mill." Words. And this is famous <laughs> last words. If you want to do the funny thing, go on. We got knocked out. They got knocked out, and we played them in the elimination match oh, on mill, right? On mill, and we beat them. And uh, it was, and it was, um, it's just kind of funny because they just destroyed us in practice, and they never wanted to do it. So I mean, it, it just it kind of caught up with them. Um, yeah, it was kind of it was hilarious. By the way, yeah, it was part of the draw. This is obviously a little bit late, like you said, 2003, when the scene's really going, right? At this time, I've talked to other people, and one of the interesting things is because obviously the internet, like people were just separated on even IRC servers, etc. There wasn't that much overlap. Like, at least in this time, as you say, Europeans sometimes boot camp or they go to the Lethal Gamers pre CPL tournament, yeah. and there was a way to like know who they were. But when you went to those first CPLs, and there would only be, you know, the one, like a Danish team or a French team would come, I'm assuming at that yeah. point, you guys knew nothing about them, and just like going in completely no, blind, right? Yeah. The very, very first <laughs> one we came to, it was, um, it was Babbage's CPL, which, uh, had eyeballers in there. And I'm trying to remember, it was basically, it was Potty, Medion, uh, H, Hib, H, H, Y, B. I can't remember, but I yeah, so. I remember when they came, like, we didn't know as much about your Euro European counter-strike outside of the fact that the rule set was different. I remember in Europe, it was chargers only. So you would only count the terrorist rounds and it had like a time limit, 45 minutes and just bulldoze people. I remember matches then there were matches where they had like 40 rounds or something crazy where right. they run over people because the rule set back then was basically um, hit, hit the, the max rounds, I think of 15 or you had 45 minutes to play the game or you could hit 15 or X amount of rounds. Right. right? So um, we didn't know much about them other than the fact that they had just a different rule set. And they just were hyper aggressive. And they were all young kids, like super young kids. I remember me and I, Sam, were just talking about was Medion would just, he would, when he would play, he had his feet up on the freaking table and he would just like play, like lean back, chill. I'm like, what is this kid? He's just wrecking everybody. And he's just playing like he's on a lazy boy, like reclined. But yeah, you just, you didn't know anything about anybody when you played them, right? You would, you would probably catch like Gothrag was the big site in the U.S. at the time. The other side, I think was so gamed, so gamed, I yeah. think is what it was. Yep. Um, and like we would catch the demo from a random POV that somebody was willing to update because people were deathly afraid to like upload their stuff because they don't want to give away their straps yes. because people didn't have a deep strap book. It's like, we're going to run the same stuff because nobody knows what we're doing and we'll just keep running it until it stops working. So you would just catch a demo of a team and you kind of just try to study it and see what they do and see what you can catch from it. But you would look at the Euro one and you'd look at ours and yeah, the, the games were different. The styles were completely different. The rules were different. And I think that's kind of the, the edge the European teams have when they came over is they would just come over and they would run us straight over sometimes because they were just hyper aggressive. Nobody had ever seen that type of style of play. And they brought bunny hopping over too. That was like another thing, right? There was a CPL where they MTW was bunny hopping. I remember it was um, Kraken and Scorp and Veersing. We would always make fun of him. We would always scream his Veersing. We would always scream in the BYOC when we played him and they were just bunny hopping. We'd never seen it before and they just taught us how to do it. And then it just exploded all over the thing. So you would just learn things at lands. You would meet them, see them for the first time. You would talk to them on IRC, and and that's just the way it was at the time. No it's, game planning. No it's, it's funny how many of the people who were pros back then, like for example, I just did one of these with Medias, and he even says because he was wasn't the sort of guy who caught media, media fully enough back in the day. So he wasn't the guy who released the demos. He never even attempted to have a frag <laughs> movie, but he even he even knows now. Like. Shit, I should have done that, shouldn't I? Like, think of all the door pass demos. Oh, my God, yeah. You were one of these guys who got this, bro. Like, and there's a lot of NA pros didn't, but you actually used to release. Anytime you had basically a good Cal game, you released the POV yeah. demo. And by the way, I think I actually did a lot for your reputation. Like, showed you were a good player, right? Yeah, I had, I had a few demos. There was a few guys that just would make, like, a killing spree, I think, was the biggest one at the time. I'd, I'd give them demos, and they'd just they'd make them. And I'm like, cool, you can just have them. Because, like, we didn't have set strats. We would run around and we would do right. things, right? Like you could outskill people. Back then when you built a team, it wasn't about like, it was about how many scary names could you put on your roster to scare the shit out of the other team. That's really like what it was. Like how many of those crazy players that had POV demos or would release their demos, how many of them could you accumulate on your team and then just run people over with like straight skill? 
So like, I wasn't really worried about any of that. I just, I give them the demos. I give them what I had and they're like, oh yeah, you look, it was awesome. You did really good in this game because back then before they had HLTV, it was the IRC bot. Remember you would just see the name scroll up on the screen. He's like, oh my God, his name scrolled like four times. I want to know what that looked like. Sure. And that's pretty much where people would message me for demos. And I would, I would just send them to them. I wasn't really worried about people anti-stratting me or knowing how I played and stuff because I just, back then I was confident. I was like, I was a kid. Like you're, if you know what I'm going to do, you're just going to have to shoot faster than me. Otherwise, I'm just going to beat you. By the way, I want to ask you a question that's a bit of a weird one because I didn't ask anyone else this, but I think you're the one person who could answer. Is which is it? It could even be a bit of column A, column B. Maybe it's a chicken and eggs. Now you tell me which is it. Is it that? The bet because the Texas land scene was the one that had like the lethal gamers and the monthly lands, and then the CPLs too, and there wasn't like money for travel. Was it that all the best teams had to come from Texas that were in NA, or early on were all the te- teams just coincidentally from Texas? Because if you ever go back, like basically the three, four best Texas teams, they could all be a t- team that could have finished top eight in a CPL or a top 16 or something, right? Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of rivalry, right? Like, so a lot of the big, good teams early on in the early Counter-Strike days before the internet, like, got real big and everybody was able to play in different different places with good ping with DSL and things like that. I mean, it was it was us. It was Domain of Pain. It was early on. It was True, which was Chameleon's team. Um, uh, what else was there? Tau. There, there was Tau. There were teams like Tau and stuff. And yeah, we had a lot of the good players, right? Like CK3, obviously. CK3. They had Big Dog, Bullseye, and K Shark at some point, right? And even before that, um, yeah, they, the Tau had had some pretty good players, or I said some good players, but DOP had Trigga and Scarface, Fida. They had um, Sneaky, a bunch of like really good players. And we were we all aggregated on the same server. It was all Domain of Games. That's where we played. And everybody would just, they would have stats. Like you'd go to the site, they'd have stats all of right. like how well you did in the pug. And that's basically where we knew each other. Like right. Chameleon was always like, he was always at the top. He was always just wrecking people playing all the time. Probably played the most out of all of us. Um, but then, you know, you would see Trig and all these other players. And yeah, that's where all the, the talent was at the time. I mean, um, Tao, you had Kane was in Tao and, and other players. I Salmon and, and RS was from there. So like Plano's Asian Gang, which is the team I was on, had a lot of really good players. And I think that's where it was. And it wasn't until like there was the leagues were better until Cal Invite came out. And then they had all the, the lower leagues come out. And then the internet got better to where everybody could play online. And that's where you saw teams like Zex um, and GB and some other teams where they were just, they were getting better. They were getting on, on the same level, but yeah, we had, we just had more lands. We had way more lands. We had Tangle land, killer land, the pre CPL boot camp. We had the CPL, everything was in Texas. And we did benefit from that for sure. Cause we had the stage matches. I mean, you guys always talk about in CS2 where it's like people get nervous when they're at the tournament, the tournament area. Right. And we were just playing these lands all the time. We were just comfortable. And that's kind of the difference between us and some of the other teams at some point. By the way, let me ask about some of the people who were in the different iterations of Riot Squad. As you mentioned, one of the, your longtime teammates was obviously Ice Salmon. And if people don't know, he's he's probably like one of the most popular players back then. Just a really chill guy, kind of a cool guy to play with. Right, give me some thoughts on this player. Because I always thought he was one of those guys that actually happened to a bunch of people in your team where people used yeah. to make out like they were onliners <laughs> or something. But like, this guy was clearly a good land player. Give me some thoughts on him. Yeah, like he started on, I remember uh, he was always wanting to get into RS and nobody would ever let him in because he just wasn't at our level. He was on a team called Skill and they, they had, it was funny, Skill was kind of like a, a team, a farm team where there was like 30 people on it and they all right. had to tag Skill. I remember one time because where I met him is we had a land at a library. We got some library to let us land in their open room and we invited like 30 people and it was their entire team and it was like five or six RS members and we played them on Dust like literally five on 16 and we beat them <laughs> okay. and the best players. Yeah. We just destroyed them. And because they just, they weren't like, they weren't playing counter right. a lot. They just played for fun. It, it was, was just their friends. Like, sure. I Sam and Ash was like the best player out of all of them. And that's where I noticed him at some point. And he was local. So like, you know, it, we put him on one of our um, teams, I think in, in the previous reflections, you talked about how some teams have four iterations of their team go to the same CPL. RS had sure. a yellow, an orange, and a green team. Syndicate did the same thing. Other teams, CK3 did the same thing. And he was basically on the, the second string team. And that's where he just, he made a name for himself. He did really well. He hard carried that team. Um, and then at some point, I was, you know, when a lot of the friends in RS, the old schoolers, as I like to call them, they didn't, they weren't as serious. They didn't want to continue on. They had school. They had life. They kind of dipped off. And then I said, okay, well, Ash, just come with me join RS. And then we started playing together and I kind of took him around with me when um, we went to PAG. We had left RS at some point to go to PAG because PAG had serious players. RS didn't have serious players. 
we have to just, we have to survive. So we joined another team and he's, he's kind of the type of the player. He was basically like a lurk. Um, you could just tell him to go somewhere and map control somewhere. I mean, like Rambo almost, I'm like, I need a kill. You need to go here and you need to do it. And strictly the only reason it was like that is whenever he was in the group, he would TK everybody. There were matches okay. where he would TK, he would TK people and he get kicked from the match because they, they oh, thought he was the rules, or right. something because of the auto ban. Yeah. The old rules. Right. So like we always had to separate him. So it was kind of just like, you do, you go over here and we'll play around kind of the space that you give us. But amazing. I mean, he was known for his one dig. I mean, the kid was just insane. One dig, insane recoil control. Um, yeah. He's just a guy you could count on to get a kill. Very, very good player. Another player yeah, I had him for most of my career. Yeah, yeah. Another guy uh, that actually started in your team, but he'll probably be more known later for playing in Zex, was the player Electric. He's probably not as remembered now, but he was another like up and coming talent, right? Yeah, I mean, Maddie was amazing. Um, we got him into RS at some point because, uh, you know, famously, after every CPL, your team basically leaves. Of course. And you just have to build another team. Like, you literally just have to build another team. So, that, and that was like the worst part. You have to start from ground zero again. And I picked him up. I picked him and Funk up, the infamous Funk, right? Um, him and Funk up. And we, we had a team. We had a pretty good team at, at the time, and I picked him up. And um, he's super nice guy, super smart. And, like, I try to tell people, like, how good he was. He, like, people thought he cheated because, like, he just had an intuition. It was almost like Flesha, where, like, right. he would just do things and you could not explain it. And I'm sitting next to him on land, and I'm like, why would you even look there? <laughs> right. Like, why would you even do that? Like, why are you even standing sure. there? What is going on? Like, I don't understand. Like, they're just flesh to have those things, and, and Matt just had those things. R never cracked under pressure. He hated playing Counter Strike, too. He only liked playing, uh, what was it, Dayok at the time. It was oh, Dayok. Dark Age of Camelot, and right? MMOs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's just like Kyle. You could not peel them off that yeah. damn MMO to True. get them to come to practice. You just couldn't do it. They're like, oh, I'm raiding. I'm like, dude, we have a land coming up. We've got to play. And we'd be on land. He'd be sitting next to me. He'd be playing Dayok while we're like joining the server ready to scrim. And I think him not taking it like super seriously is why he's such a good player. Like right. he just didn't put a lot of pressure on himself. He was very cerebral and right. very solid aim. I mean, he was amazing. Yeah. And I remember because at the time when RS was kind of disbanding and we were kind of like, I was retiring and everything. We were just like, he had an op open offer to go to Zex at the time. And I'm like, dude, we can't stop you. Like right. we're, we're folding. <clears throat> you got to go where you can go. And and when they pick, picked him up, it was, I mean, they had a like, cracked lineup. I mean, it was like Sunman. Uh, who am I missing on that Zex team? It was electric, Shagla, Sunman, Volcano. Revenge. Volcano. Yeah, all these guys. Volcano. Yeah. I mean, they had a real cracked team uh, yeah. at the time. So it was just like, I can't stop you from doing that. And, and, and I, I tell people to this day, he was the reason they were successful. Like when he joined, that's when they went on that run where they True. were beating European teams and yep. going to Europe and, and playing things. They were just, they were amazing. Yeah, they were a really good team. Matt was awesome. He was a great teammate. He's just hard to peel him off of MMOs. I, I Salmon was the same way. He played EverQuest at the time. It was super hard to pull him off to, to play as well. They would just complain and whine. They just never liked practicing, which ultimately I think was like the downfall of the team on, on the success of the team. But right. yeah, it was it was pretty difficult. You know, the funniest thing is, you'll remember this, because back in the day, it wasn't even World of Warcraft. It was actually EverQuest was the first one. And because famously, the like there were so many, we used to all call it Evercrack because the premise was yeah. when someone started that game, it was like, it was like they started doing crack, it's over for them. They're just going to end up like not playing <laughs> CS anymore. And the joke is, we almost did treat you like drugs, bro, because like, I maybe in the early days, I played like Ultima Online or something before like, I got big into CS and Quake, right? But even I used to purposely never play these games because I treated it like it was drugs. Like, But if I started though, maybe I'll become one of them. I mean, like for real it sounds mad now but we actually there was a famous thing in cs right where it's like the, we were almost like the crack widows of like the great players that yeah. just went and they never came back or they came back like you say occasionally and they yeah. show a bit of their skill but you knew like like someone who's on drugs like mate if you clean your life up you'd be amazing at this game you could be like the number <laughs> one player in NA, right yeah i mean everquest was something else i mean once you start everybody it was a joke it was literally like doing crack it's like you do it once you can't stop that's what yeah. everybody that's the rumor everybody says and the second they would play EverQuest, every, I mean, Rambo had played, me and Rambo had lost three summers playing Ultima. We were playing Counter-Strike 5-2 and playing Ultima. And after that Ultima binge, I was like, I'm never playing an MMO again. I lost so much time, but then I got addicted to Counter-Strike. So it was just a different <laughs> a different type right. of game. Yeah, EverQuest was, was, it was something else. Like I just, I could not start it because you people would just play it through the night into the morning all the time. I remember like when they had internet at the at the lands and stuff, like they people would be playing it in the CS tournaments yep. and the BYOC. There was one time where Ash fell asleep. Um, we he fell asleep at his desk, like under his table, before a match was starting because he was playing like EverQuest or something. And 
we he was late to the match because we couldn't find him, but he was under the t- under the table, passed out. So yeah, I mean, it it's good to play in like an alternate game because sometimes people get sick sure. of Counter Strike. But you you love the players that just love playing Counter Strike. Yes. They don't have any other game. Like I didn't have a second game outside of Ultima. Once Ultima was gone, I just played Counter Strike, and that was it. And you just love those players that did that because you you just never have to argue with them to get them to play. They would just play. I mean, that's the thing I would ask about you further, though. It's like, it's, that's another reason why I think there's also an extra appeal to being the leader of a team. Because if you're just playing, maybe you are just playing for ego. You know, you, it's like basketball. Did I make the shot? Did I make the cool move? If you're the leader, you also have the whole interesting dynamic of like, can I get a better player? Let's upgrade our strats. Let's work on this match. Let's prep for this next opponent in Cal. Like, it actually, it has like an extra like element of interest, right? It seems like you were into it. Yeah, yeah. So, like, in the beginning, I wasn't really the IGL for, for RS. It was uh, Warsaw, and we had Rambo at the time. So, like, I was kind of like the second caller at the time because I just I cared a lot about wanting to win. I wanted. I was really interested about what are the other teams were doing, the just the strats and, and the ways they were doing things. And it wasn't until, like, Rambo left that it was just like, okay, well, like, I either have to stay in RS and recruit new players and figure out how to do it without him. Um, we're going somewhere else. So that's when, you know, I, I just kept RS, I recruited them, and then I became the IGL. And uh, I was kind of like the, the second player on the team, right? I was the second kind of star player on the team. It was me and Rambo doing a lot of the things at the time. And um, at that point, it was just, it's, it's difficult because once you're the IGL, you start seeing the game in a different way. You visualize, you worry about what the other players are doing, and you care more about the game because you want to win. People rely on you to make the right calls. They rely on you to know what to do, like when the shit hits the fan, right? Like when when things aren't working, they look to you. So yeah, I mean, I think IGLs they care at a different level than other players do, strictly from the perspective of the the team's a unit. And the, for the team to be successful, you have to care a lot, which I did at the time. And I think it impacted like how well I was playing at the time because I had to shoulder a lot of uh the load, right? How would you describe your style? Because what I remember from the demos, I pretty remember, you had a really good op. Like I said, you were one of the guys who actually could no-scope quite reliably. You could, you could kind of yeah. combat op a bit, right? Yeah, I mean, style-wise, I mean, everybody likes to commit. Like, at the time when we were playing, it was Kyle, it was Johnny R, and all those other pe- people in Europe that, that were opping. My style, I mean, it was like, I, I didn't like long-range opping. I wasn't very, like, Cobble was like my worst map, probably, because it was all long-range opping. But there are demos or instances where you see me and I'm playing like on the ramp in one of the bomb sites sure. in front of where the T's come out with an op or something. And that's just my mid-range, close-range op was like where I felt most comfortable. That's where I hit all my shots. So it was kind of like a, you know, like a fallen Kenny S type thing where you just want to be in the pocket in front of somebody just quick zooming people and stuff. You weren't just waiting around. You were trying to make things happen. And I, I was just mid-range was like where I like to be. And that's kind of like where I opt. And I wasn't really the primary op. Like it just... Nobody else did it. I just did it. So at the time, like I would buy it. It was more of like a hybrid, you say. So I would just pick it up depending on the map, right? If we played Prodigy, I was always opting down boxes. If we're, you know, playing Cobble, I would always opt the B-bomb side in the back or something. So it was just, it just kind of fell to me, right? Nuke, I play outside. Everywhere the opt would play, I would be. So it just kind of fell on me. Give me a story, because as you say, there was the CPL where you had the infamous Funk, who, it's not a meme, guys. There actually was famously, it was a real picture. It's, people just put all the teams he'd been in. And it was like, you remember this picture. It was like, got oh, 30 teams, mate. Something meant, even like, whereas the joke is, like in this interview, you were in about like three teams, and one of those was just a, a combination of two. You know what I mean? Like, he, this guy was in every team. And unfortunately, the problem he always had was, for whatever reason, he was just a very unpopular player. Like people, essentially, I would say, if people want to cut some of an image up, he's like the kid that would get shoved in a locker in school doesn't always mean you're the bad guy it just means yeah. there's something about you rubs people the wrong way but the problem I always thought sickness was that made a lot of people just say he sucked or something but he clearly wasn't actually bad like I mean first of all he's someone who also had like a good vision for building teams and getting yeah. people so give me some thoughts because it, it must have been a little bit more complicated than just like he was a kid yeah. out of the scene or whatever. How, why did why was he in your team why did you bring him in yeah, I mean, it didn't help that he cheated, and that's uh, sure, probably why sure. like, a lot of people gave him, the, they were like, you know, you never play well on land, you cheated online. Right. And uh, he just, I'm sorry, David, but David, like, he didn't, he had a personality, like you said, that just would annoy people. He was kind of like um, Smuya, right? Like, there you Smuya go, has a good a hard time staying yeah. in teams. He has a hard time staying in teams because he's just... I mean, he's a kid. He's got his just attitude. People just doesn't it just doesn't jive with people. Yes. And that's the way the way Funk was. Um, I gave him a chance. They were in Houston. Electric and um, Funk were in Houston. I gave him a chance to come join the team because they were close. We wanted to keep the team local so that we could land a lot and stuff. And he had, I mean, he was a good player. He 
his problem um, really like on its consistency on land and everything is he was just a huge settings like he's like Boros. He I've heard he would like do it in the, ma- in the match though, right? Like mid game or something. He, he would change his uh, like console commands in games, oh, before no. games, after games. Oh, my right. Using right. the right mouse pad. Am I using the right sensitivity? Oh, I noticed this person uses this sensitivity. So I'm going to change this sensitivity. Like, he was just like hardcore adjusting settings all right. the time and it would get into his head. Oh, I'm doing really good with my update rate at this number. And you know, I'm my, doing really well at my sensitivity here. So that was like his biggest problem. And I think it impacted his, 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 you know, consistency on land. Um, he was comfortable online. I don't think he had any issues. I mean, he was a decent player. He just couldn't get past people just not liking him as a person and the previous cheating accusations. I mean, there was a, I don't know if you've heard about this, but people parted his computer out at a yeah. CPL and the OSC. Yeah. They just stole all of his stuff. Like, uh, people just did not like this kid. And he was all right when he was RX. He was a right. nice guy. I mean, had no problems with him. Like, um, RX was kind of a team. Like, a lot of our success was, like, we were laid back. We didn't, we weren't strict. I mean, we had, like, a system that we wanted people to play and how we wanted to play. But it was like, you know, we would pick players we could get along with that were local and that um, we could just get them comfortable. Like, you, in the later on iteration, we pulled in Jaden and Grazel, which they had problems on other teams with consistency and and sometimes they called them chokers. They were in like imminence and, and Jaden was in, you know, a lot of other better teams, but we pulled them over. We just made them comfortable. We let them actually play together in the same spots, the same sites on T side, they would just kind of group together and we worked them into the system. So we would just make people comfortable and laid back. And I think Funk, he just had a whole team playing with people. We just made it easy for him by just, you know, do what you want to do. What's what makes you successful. And I'll make the game plan around you. Right. That's, that's usually what I do. And, the joke me and Ash have is, is we've taken more American players to the top 10 than any U.S. team. Right. Because every time we went to a CPL, we would be in the top 10. I think the, the best we ever got was like in 2003. I think it was the event that um, uh, 3D won, right? When they played Gamers Online. I think we got 7th or 8th or something like that in that one. That was probably our best placing with really good teams in it outside of the earlier CPLs, which, you know, we won or we placed a lot higher in. But, yeah, it's crazy. I actually want to ask you about some of the players you just referenced there. So actually, if if people don't remember the player Grazel, because he wasn't a super famous name, I mean, that at least doesn't last to this day. At the CPL you all talk about, though, he had that famous game on Nuke where he had like a fucking 30 bomb or something. I forget how many it was, but he had some game where yeah. he went mad. As you're saying, your team was actually pretty good at sort of like either scouting up and coming people or people that others had gotten rid of and they thought, yeah. oh, this guy's no good. So can you give me some thoughts on this player? Obviously, his name hasn't really endured, but he was a pretty good player back yeah. then. Yeah. He's, he's a gem. I think his, his, uh, we used to, I mean, he would go by Grazzle in game, but we call him backbone because he was just, he would break the team's back with the type of stuff he would do. And then he would be the backbone of the team. I and mean, he was like a motivator. He was a glue guy. He was a guy you need on the team. I'm trying to like, think of like who, who he would be like. I mean, there's not a lot of players that are, are like him. Um, gosh, he was just, a, he was just a guy you want on your team because he made things fun and he, he, he was, he played hard. He practiced hard. And he was a primary opera. So when he came to RS, like he kind of just took over the opping. We met him. Um, I met him a long time ago. Like he wanted to get into DOP. He was playing online with a bunch of friends. I talked to him on IRC and he just wasn't as good. And we just played online. He kind of went off and did his own thing, grinded and got really good. And he got on to, uh, he started playing on Eminence. We met him at a WCG qualifier in New York. He was on Eminence with, um, the best, uh, right? Jaden was on that team. The Bears, Jaden. The Bears Dude, here's Grapple. a reference I mean, for you. Because- this is how good my yeah. memory is. That's the, I, I yeah. remember this. That's the World Cyber yes. Games where it had a, yes. an infamous moment where the Bears' girlfriend just went like, baby girl, want to go Korea? Or something like in the middle of like the yeah. match, even though, by the way, they came nowhere close to qualifying and like didn't make it. But like that was like a community meme back then because Bears was also yeah. a ridiculous personality too. <laughs> yeah, he was... Uh, they played on that team. That team was actually really good. Um, they, they got knocked out early. And it, it's infamous at CPL when you have to rebuild a new team after every event because whatever reason people just want to quit after an event. You scout. That's the scouting. Right. That's the perfect scouting yeah. opportunity. I would watch every single game, watch every single player, and I knew at the time, like you know, I had I had Electric, I had Ice Sam, and I had me, and I'm like, okay, we just need two players to fill at the time because. That we knew the team. Like we had. I imagine it's also a good. It's obviously also more of a premium back then to be able to watch someone on land yes. and know they're good, right? Because you can't really exactly. know based on Cal invite. Maybe they're choker, right? Yeah. So we, we were losing two players at the time and I'm like, okay, we just need two players. I mean, which, which team is going to, you know, break up, which team can we like talk to people? And I knew gravel from before. Right. So when they got knocked out, we were just chilling, we were talking and they're like, okay, the team's going to break apart. I'm like, well, I'll take you and Alex. That's who I want. That's, that's who I want. 
let's let's do this right um the bears the is really really good at the time too like if i had an opportunity to pick them up i would have done it sure. um but he was really good but yeah him and and alex came together and steve is just a really fun guy to play with he's very dedicated he keeps things kind of laid back um and yeah i mean that the, that world cyber games was hilarious because after we got knocked out of that tournament um we went to go play a team at 3 a.m in queens at their land center and it was the worst computers and we played them for money and which was a mistake because we lost because we played them on their home turf on their computers and their computers right. were awful like it was the worst computers i've ever ever have played played on in my life i i remember it because after the, the land tournament like um our manager who was this is laurent at the time i'm not sure if you're familiar with glow the guy Stick, became the admin we, for the cpl afterwards right yeah yeah we, we had to ride a train back to get to where we were at. And I remember because everybody got on the train and while the train was stopping, I swung my fleece with my um, ticket in it at the train and it got stuck on the train operator door and they, the guy just took off. And the team left me in Queens at like 3 a.m. Like little kid, like 16 years old in Queens. It just, I remember that event. But yeah, that WC Cyber Games was was kind of a turning point for us because we picked them, Grazzle and um, Jaden Jaden up and we, we did really well. I mean, the... the we won a lot of the local tournaments. They would drive up from St. Louis. I think that's why they they kind of the Bears and all of them were together. They were in right. St. Louis, so they drove down to Texas all the time. They stayed at the RS house, which was basically Laurent Glowstick's house, and we would land all the time. We would go to all the Tango lands, all the Texas lands. We would we would it was rough in the beginning because I think we lost our first land, um, which I found out to this day we lost that land because a girlfriend from the other team was ghosting for the team that beat us. Okay, which I found out which I found out like not too long ago. Somebody oh, messaged right. me. About yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, we, I remember going to that CPL with that team and that was probably the best team we had. If we had kept that team together um, and went to like one more event, I think we would have done really well because we beat a lot of, uh, we beat some good teams. I mean, yeah. we, we beat e uh, Eolithic, we beat uh, Esports United. And um, I always tell people it's like the RS curse. Every tournament we go to, Ronald would always knock us out of the tournament. We've almost every tournament we played at, X3 or 3D would put us in the loser's bracket. We just had a problem just beating them. We could just never beat them, but we would beat everybody else we would play. But that, yeah, they kind of completed our lineup and made us like way better than we'd ever been before. By the way, I ask everyone this, but I'll ask you it as well, right? Back then, I actually used to know a lot of the top players. So I used to think initially, ah, they're just grumbling because they lost an online game. But actually, from knowing too many players, bro, every person who played in Cal Invite thinks multiple other people cheated in Cal Invite because there was no anti-cheat. Oh, yeah. It was online. And, <laughs> the, and sometimes, and here's the worst part of it, Sickness, is because sometimes people would think, well, I know he's doing it, so I'll do it. Bro, some of the people who are good online even cheated in these games. Like, I used to tell people, that's the worst thing because you know back in the day the, the vibe of cheaters were like oh the noobs who aren't good at the game it's like no it's worse than that some of the actual real good land players just think like well he's probably cheating against me so I'll turn him on and do it back like this, it's, these are supposed to be like the equivalent of like the NFL regular season you know like what, do you also think people cheated back then do you think it was going on yeah I mean to this day I think I mean, one of the big teams that we thought cheated was Zex I mean they came out of nowhere right. there was a player on that team named Jaspel I think yeah. it was like the, the dude was just just garbage on land. He never played well. And online, it was just like he had the sixth sense. He could find out where you right. were. You know, it was flush of sun, right? He could just spam you through walls. And, and Sun Man probably got a little bit of the a lot of the a lot of the things too. He would do crazy things too, right? Sure. And it, I just don't think. I mean, maybe they were cheating. Maybe they weren't cheating. Um, but Counter Strike has this this problem. Like even to this day, when I play with my friends online, they're like, "Oh, that guy's cheating. That guy's doing this. Like if he's beating you, he's cheating, right?" Yeah. And that's just something in Counter-Strike that was a problem. And back then, like, there was no, I mean, we had Punk Buster, but like, it was garbage. Yeah, it was. Like, people, people, you know, I've got wall hacked. I mean, there was this LAN we played at, we played at LAN Shark, and I remember we played a Cal Invite match from LAN Shark against a team called And uh, we were up, like, it was a Prodigy. We won, like, 10 rounds on Prodigy CT, and like, and one of the Trig came up to me, he goes, that guy over there on that team, he's definitely cheating. I go, I guarantee you, Right before you're about to get the last round to win, he's just going to cheat. And like, I had dropped like 30 kills. I think there's a demo out there on it. The other guy dropped like 30 kills also. And afterwards, we found out that he was cheating. He was wall hacking. They reviewed his demos and he was wall hacking. So, I mean, it does happen. I don't know if any of the top teams were doing it. I'm, I'm I played enough against a lot of the top teams that I don't think they were cheating, like Zex and them. But we always said they were. I mean, that was just the thing. We just didn't know who they were at the time, right? And it came out of nowhere and like, oh yeah, he's definitely cheating. There's no way he's not cheating. But 
some teams played from land centers, which kind of helped things. So um, I think that kind of helped a lot of people because we would always play from our land center and Tao would play from like land shark and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, cheating was prevalent. It's just the same as it is today. It's probably was worth back then because there was no, vis there was not as much visibility logging and, you know, exposure to like what people were doing or as many games to play, right? You referenced it with Jaden. I did want to ask about him because I've always thought he was an, another player, by the way, who got saved by being in your team. Like you're saying, get like a top eight finish because yeah. he had like, just like Bears, he had this really terrible rep because of the 3D one of like, he's a choker online and then obviously famously tech also fucked up with that tech super team. But the weirdest yeah. thing about him, I always, I've even told him this, was bro, he wasn't even one of those guys who only played online. That was like his second event. He used to play a million lands, like you said, like, so he actually yeah. was one of those players who clearly was good. He just, maybe unlucky in his career or something. And, also if people don't know yeah. he was like an all-around talent right he could all he could write he was just a really good player yeah he's really good at quake 3 and remember we would play quake 3 a lot but um yeah i mean alex just i don't know what it is i mean i think maybe when you're in 3d there's a lot of pressure on you right sure. people just expect you to win they expect you to drop you know when i joined x3 it was just like any game you were in you were expected to win all the time right and you were expected to drop there was always all eyes on you if you lost it was just a massive choke and I think some play, I don't think he had like an issue with that. I just think people put a lot of pressure on him because you've got a core of a team, which is usually like a group of three players. And then you add like two players later and the core of the team kind of judges the new players a bit more, right? There was just a lot of pressure on them. And when people come, like when I found them and I brought them to RS, there wasn't as much pressure. There's not as much pressure on RS as there is 3D. And then it was just along the lines of like, if I have to move my spot to make him comfortable, I would do it, right. I would just do it. I would just move around. I had no problem with it. I felt like I could fill any position. So I was just like, you know what? You need to play where you're comfortable with and do what you need to do to win. And then I will make the strats around how you play. And that's just basically what we did. We we brought him in. We let him and Grazel play together in bomb fights. We let them play kind of in the same positions. When they were on terrorist side, we would buddy them up together so they would trade. And we just made them comfortable. And I didn't put any pressure on him. And we would just have fun. I mean, we would just, we would do funny things i remember at that event that we did really well at we were at the the hyatt regency hotel and i went to go play on some piano that was in the lobby and the security guard came up to us behind us and was like he came up to me and just pulled my shoulder and yelled at me he's like who be playing on my piano i'm like i was i was so scared i'm like i don't know what happened and we just took that moment and every time we got a kill when we were playing we're like who be playing on my piano we're like just saying that so you just hear us yelling during games saying that grazel changed his alias to the pianist and we would just play like that we would play loose we would play happy we just like being around each other it's kind of like um I i've seen some interviews from things with mouths now right they just like playing with each right. other the same I mean, by the way, this is quite a unique like kind of aspect. Things. Like a lot of other people were like super hardcore, like inflaming each other yeah. or silent. Right? Was it a big deal exactly, to you to have this yeah. kind of vibe? Yeah, the, and, and that's just kind of the core of what RS was. We right. were high school friends. We played together. We liked being around each other. So when we recruited people, I'm only gonna. I mean, if you're good, yeah, I'll bring you to my team. If you're good, but if I can't stand you and I can't, you know, I can't help you, I'm just not going to bring you to my team. So we brought them. We liked them. We we knew them online. We hung around with them. And we would just we would just have fun. And I think that was where we just did well. We just we liked each other. And I think that was like the biggest thing. I think that's where it just took the pressure off of you because it does take a lot of pressure off of you when not only do you have to worry about like the community flaming you for playing bad and the crowd and the playing on tournament computers and stuff that you also have to worry about your teammates judging you. Right. And they knew we weren't judging them. We're like, we're all in it together. Like we're just we're going to win. And if we lose, we lose. That's fine. You referenced earlier, so I want to rewind a bit. When you said earlier the point that in NACS especially, people weren't trying to be super tactical beyond like the chameleons of the world. And actually, famously, it was Morto in that the speakeasy offensive TSO team who really put a lot of time in that. I actually used to talk to him back then, so I knew him quite well. I can tell you, yeah. he really was doing like the dry runs in the servers. In fact, as far as I remember, the story even went, not only he'd been kicked out of X3, but he'd been in de Domain of Pain, if you remember, trying to make them the next ones. And the real problem with that class of players who were all the top NACS players was they all wanted to play individually bro because it all was about being the carry and being the one who's going to win the game and so I remember the reason he even made joined the TSO team bro is because they weren't all the top players they were like a bunch of friends and so he knew like right yeah. I can basically convince these guys somebody. yeah let's do some tactics let's do some teamwork yeah. like, you're, you aren't the ego players who think you're going to beat Rambo etc so you were one of the few people who knows this because you played them in that Cal Invite final you played them in that season was that actually like a, did you think they were a legit team was it a good approach yeah, I mean, they were super legit. They were super, um, I mean, they were well oiled. I mean, it's like you had a white screen and a bomb site every time they came in, right. right? Like consistent white screen. It wasn't like throw flash, 
turn, half faded, turn around and fight. It was flash coming in front of you, turn around, flash coming over your head while you're turning around, that type of stuff, right? And that just wasn't very common. I mean, Moto, like, uh, it was just an interesting player because I remember when I first played him, he was in a West Coast team called TDK, TD something. I remember him because he used the AUG um, exploit on Nuke in the back of the box where you could duck right. and you could just shoot. And they used it before. Like, that's where I remember him from. But yeah, I mean, there weren't very many teams doing it. I mean, Dustin, like I said, I felt like he was first. And then um, Moto kind of came after. And it was so effective on TSO because it was like, I mean, I always try to compare it to like modern time. It's like a Cadian type thing, right? Every player on that team as a separate person, nobody knew who the hell they were. Yes. Nobody knew how good they were. They were just regular dudes. Yep. They were just consistent, decent players. And then you put Moto with them and they all buy in, they all listen and they just do what he says. Right. And then you just turn it into a really good team. I remember because we played that that game. We went to I think we went to a land center because um, we and in that version of RS, we had Chameleon and we had Trig. Um, and we lost to them on, I think it was like dust two. We lost, we actually lost like pretty close. I think it was like a 13, 11 yeah, game. We was. almost beat them. Yeah. We almost saw the undefeated season. I remember, I remember that because when we lost the game, I, I broke my keyboard after the game by slamming my desk and they kicked us out of that Lancer and never let us come again. So that's why it sticks out in my head, um, a lot, but yeah, I mean, he was unique. Him and Dustin were definitely unique. People just listened. I mean, and that's like kind of a sign of a good like IGL, right? Like, you know, when you speak, do people listen, right? Yes. And that's like, that's, you know, a lot of people when they play, like like if I wanted to go play in another team and I was IGLing and I go play, I eventually over time become the IGL because like I have like right. a strong voice and like I can see like where somebody's messing up and then eventually I just assert myself, right? And that's just that's just the way it is. And, and there's just all certain unique people that are like that, that they can take the pressure, right, of being watched by people and losing rounds and, like I said earlier, it's like when you're losing five, six rounds in a row, people are like, well, what do we do? Like, you can't just turn around and be like, I don't know. Like, it's a special person. And he was, they had Dustin and, and Moto, they were really good at it. And they had players, too. They, like, once they got out of TSO, I mean, he made his way. I mean, he had the undefeated season. And then people trusted him after that. Nobody knew who he was. And that's why probably he had a lot of friction getting recruited to a team. Like, he was just some random dude on, I think he was on the West Coast at the time. And uh, I remember he'd messaged me to join PAG or something. I'm like, I don't know who you are. Like, I can't just let you in. I've never seen you that that often. So, yeah, sometimes it just it takes, you know, a good game, a good demo and for him, a incredible season. Right. And then then he gets paired with good players. And then at that point, it's just he's unstoppable. Right. You get the aim paired with the strats. One thing I've referenced many times on these old interviews, because people won't relieve how extreme this was. I always say in the same way as there were the early CPLs and what you would find is, it's not that people, I always say this, onliners clearly aren't bad. They're really good at the game, but only online. But the problem is you would see a second you went to the CPLs, like, oh shit, like half this team are onliners, but no one knew because you've never been to a LAN yet. You all just thought, yeah. we're all good. You turn up, no one knows <laughs> they're going to joke on LAN. No one knows there's going to be pressure. You only kind of find out it's sink or swim. That's perfect analogy. You just, it works or it doesn't right yeah. and the problem i can tell yeah. you back then was this culture of like right well we're the real land players but they're the onliners actually did lead to a world where when i knew all these top players Morto, rambo kesha all the top ones people in dorp people in town the ones who were the original like kings of LAN, bro some of these guys had it in their head that like the onliners would never get good online and it would just be these like yeah. 15 people forever would win every cpl and anyone who anyone who they didn't think made their grid they were mega elitist bro like put it this way you were a good player. I can tell you right now, they would have told me like your shit or like, you know, or like if, if it was yeah. K-Shot Rambo. They didn't want to let me in. Yeah, they'd be like, oh, we would, we would never lose to this guy. You know, we're better. Like, do, what would you yeah. say about that? Because I don't think people realize it's not just that they were top players. They had like a set, they had a crazy gatekeeping yeah. vibe, right? Yeah. I mean, when I was an X3, like um, when we played online, there was no game planning. Like right. literally, I remember we played a game on Aztec and you know what the strat was before the game? We'd be talking in the chat. We'd be like, all right, Let's just all save for ops and then all five of us will buy ops. <laughs> okay. And there's no, and it literally it was like, they're like, well, if Kyle misses, you're not going to miss. And if so, you miss, Bullseye's not going to miss. Like, we're just going to op them. And half of them are going to be scared of us anyways. Once they hear the op, they're going to knock them out the door. So it's literally like half of the strats when we played online. I won a, I won a, a tournament with them online where it was just like nobody practiced. We just showed up and we played because we were just that much better than people. And yeah, I mean, there was, there was kind of like, you know, people were very cocky, you know, like I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk to you or like, you know, don't talk to me. Yes. They would get messy. Like, I remember when I joined uh, X3 at the time, 
I got messaged like an IRC, my chat bubbles were like all the way to the right. Everything was just like blowing me up. People would message me all the time. And when I was in the team, people would message me nonstop all the time. So I'm sure they, they're getting blown up 24 seven by random people sure. all the time. But yeah, I think part of the downfall, I think is one, they never lost online ever before they played NIP, yeah, yeah. never lost online. There was never any worry we would lose. We would always win. Like if somebody had a bad game, another person would have a good game, right? And then at some point when you got to land and you start playing like these on these onliners, at some point, they're going to start killing you. And then you're, it's in your head like, this guy was crap online. How was he playing so well? And then you, you've just never been put in the situation sure. of somebody's killing me that's not supposed to be killing me. And this team is not supposed to be doing well. And oh, crap, we're losing. What do we do when we're behind? I think that was one of the biggest problems with with them is like when Nip were like running them over like on Nuke or something like it you know it, like, I remember like Potty would go outside strafe and just two tap big dog right it's like you've never nobody's ever done that to you yes like they never they would we would scrim online we would play people there was nobody in the United States at the time that we knew we could not beat like even with with X three playing them or scrimming them like it wasn't that bad like i took uh when i played on pag i went to two talent by finals against them lost close close tight games right and they would not do stuff like that and i think that was part of the problem it's like you got to lose a few times before you become a really good team it just it's just the nature of the beast you have to know what to do when you're losing and that was part of the problem of being too cocky right I'm not saying that's the reason they lost no, no. but it probably it's a kind of beautiful factor yeah Everyone needs a support network, and mine is, of course, my Patreon community, the Scrominati, who, in many ways, they're the sunny to my share, saying, I got you, babe. So this video and all the others on my channel were kindly supported by the following names. I met a Jew, Matt Pugnaccio Rakula, Adam Tomlin, Animosity, Jensen Gore, Tosh, Toucan, and you know it. Jerky's minion, my main man, always going to be referenced, one of the best patrons of all time. Would you like to ask a question in my AMA? Maybe you want to suggest a topic or a guest to see on my channel? Do you want teasers? Find out who the upcoming Reflections and Talk to Thor interviews are. Maybe you want to do one of those long discussions where you get to set the topics we talk about. Well, if any of these or others appeal to you, put your money where your mouth is. Join the Scaluminati today via the Patreon link in the description box below.